Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, uh, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. And we're continuing in our series. Uh, the subject is Heaven. Uh, this is part four. We're going through a book written by Randy Alcorn uh, with the title Heaven. So if you haven't seen the previous episodes, I highly recommend you go back and start from the beginning. But we're not going to rehash all that right now. Uh, but first, let me uh, introduce the panelists. Uh, we got Sister Tanya. Want to say hi? You guys still there? Mm -hmm. Okay. How about Brother Mitch? Can you say hi? Hello, everybody. It's Brother Mitch out here. Yes. That's uh, Mitchell Belenkoff is his YouTube channel. I hope everybody will subscribe to him. Uh, now we got Brother Eric. Hey, Brother Eric out here. Uh, Jesus Night 72 is my YouTube channel. Glad to be here as always. Okay. And we got Brother Jason. Praise the Lord, Jason Warner, W E R N E R, in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, seated in heavenly places. Thanks a lot, Luke. Amen. And let's try Sister Tanya again. Are you there, Tanya? Yes, I am. Sorry about that. Okay. Just say hi to everybody. We're just starting. Hey, everybody. Good to see you. Um, and that is all. Okay. All right. Thank you, panelists, for joining me. Okay, uh, right now we're going to, we we've been talking about, uh, first of all, let me ask anybody if you've had any other thoughts on what we covered last time, uh, if there's anything else you need to like say to, uh, uh, if you've had any reflection on uh, anything that we discussed. We're talking about the intermediate heaven. You see, when, when, a person, uh, when a Christian dies today, they don't go down to, Hades into paradise waiting for Jesus to save them because Jesus has already taken paradise and, and uh, the, the Old Testament saints up into heaven. But the heaven that they're in now and the heaven that you and I will go to if we died right now is, is called the intermediate heaven, or at least that's how Randy Alcorn refers to it, intermediate. And that this is a temporary heaven uh, until uh, the, there is a new heaven, a new earth created which will be our eternal condition. We'll go into the eternal heaven uh, a little later, but we've been discussing this intermediate state of heaven. And the question we've been asking is, um, is this intermediate heaven, uh, does it have any physical reality to it, or is it completely non-physical, just kind of another dimension of a, a spiritual reality rather than physical reality? So that's what we've been talking about. Uh, so, uh, anybody just say any thoughts uh, uh, on that before we pick up where we left off? Okay, I'm going to start where we left off reading this uh, book by Randy Alcorn. He says, in the Apostle, Paul's account of being caught up to the intermediate heaven, which he calls the third heaven, he expresses uncertainty about whether he'd had a body there or not. I think we talked about this at the very end last time. Uh, and uh, what, he says, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows. So when the Apostle Paul, I think uh, this is an account of when he was stoned. Um, he was taken out of a city. He was stoned, left for dead. And I believe this is an out-of-body experience where he went to heaven. It could have been a vision, but Paul seems to, is making the point that uh, I went to this heaven, and I saw it, and he talks about his experience there, but he, uh, we don't, he didn't even know if it was there in the body, if his whole body was transported there, or if it was just a, a, his spirit had gone there. So I uh, want to say anything about that, and that's, that's where we left off last time. Okay, I'll move on to this next point. Uh, we do not receive resurrection bodies immediately after death. Resurrection is not a one at a time. If we have intermediate forms in the intermediate heaven, they won't be our true bodies, which have died. Continuity is only between our original and resurrection bodies. Uh, if we are given intermediate forms, they are at best temporary vessels comparable to the human uh, appearing bodies that angels sometimes take on, distinct from our true bodies, which remain dead until our resurrection. 
So uh, I understood what he was saying. Does anybody understood the, the point he was making there and you want to kind of put it in your own words? I think oh, I think the, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, no, I was just going to say real quick. Um, I think between this and going back to what Paul was saying, he's questioning whether he was in his body or, or not in his body because you get the impression that he – had leave of his senses. He he either felt or was aware of certain things like you would be in your body. You get that impression, which is why he, you know, he may not, you know, the angels were able to manipulate things, angel, you know, um, uh, and Paul must have felt to some degree, maybe he maybe he smelled things, or even our presence, when we, when we go out into a humid day, we feel the presence of humidity, we feel, we, we feel this to our touch, to our, you know, our senses. Um, Maybe I, I that was always to me what I felt what he was trying to say was it and which is why he kind of was confused whether he was in a body or not because he 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 felt senses he felt the sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mitch. I was just saying that I, I kind of equated to sleeping like dreaming. I mean, you know, um, I walk around in my dream somewhere, you know, around the house, whatever it is, and you know, sometimes I go to the refrigerator and and get out some chocolate cake. I don't know whether I'm eating it or not, you know. <laughs> mm hmm Yeah. Um, <coughs> can we look up, uh, s s um, Eric, you look up 2 Corinthians 12, verse 3. Uh, I, th I can't remember if it said that Paul was caught up <coughs> to the third heaven, uh, what the exact terminology of that was. But I don't think we can necessarily conclude whether this was some kind of a vision he had of heaven or if it was an out-of-body or in-the-body transfer, like a raptured up to heaven to see it. Yeah, it, it seemed to me like a similarity to something like that because what he says in 2 Corinthians 12 is, for, is a combination of 3 and 4. He uses terminology. He says, um, he says, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. Um, which, again, goes back to he had some reason to believe he might have been in his body, which tells me maybe he had some leave of his senses, some kind of senses. Um, and then verse 4 he says, how the, thou, excuse me, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Okay, when you're caught up, this is a terminology that's associated with rapture. Uh, Enoch was caught up. And, and Enoch was, uh, we consider that Enoch was a, uh, one of two people who've already been raptured. Right. Uh, Enoch and... Uh, Elijah. Elijah, uh, Elijah, yeah. Elijah, right. Uh, so uh, because of the terminology, uh, I would lean towards the idea that he was actually raptured and taken up there, probably in the his whole body. Uh, but um, I don't know if we can have a real strong conclusion on whether it was a vision or a, a raptured uh, so he could go up to heaven and experience it. But he, he also says that he can't tell us everything he saw up there. He has to keep some of it secret too. So that's pretty exciting and interesting. That, uh, um, But I think the point Randy Alcorn's making here is that he says Paul is actually saying that he wasn't sure if he was in the body or not in the body and therefore uh, we should not rule out the fact that when we go to this intermediate heaven, we have bodies. You, you see the logic of that? Yeah. Actually, I think that's why Paul might have put that in the verse. I think he put it in there because he didn't want to assume anything and put it down as being incorrect. Mm -hmm. So he was saying whether in the body or out of the body, I, I could not tell. So he's, he's saying, you know, I don't want to make an assumption. I don't know. I might have been in my body. He, so he, he, he didn't want to act as if he knew for certain. Okay, what do you think of this point that uh, Randy Elkhorn makes here when he says that we, we have this, our body, and then our body dies, and our body is cremated or buried or whatever, or lost at sea, whatever happens to people's bodies, the various things after they die, and they go up this intermediate heaven, uh, and then later on there's a rapture, and that body is resurrected, uh, and they have a glorified body again, but so that's the true body, your old body, and then your resurrected body. But in the in the in the in between state, someone who's in heaven right now, before the resurrection has happened, uh, do they have a body? That's the question. And what is it? He's proposing that perhaps this is some kind of like uh, where angels took physical form. Angels do not uh, inherently have a physical body, but they can manifest themselves with bodies, as we've seen in scripture. 
So you think that's a, a, a the correct way to, to view that? I think so, and and this is kind of based on the discussion we were kind of we were having with Austin last time. Um, everything about the God's holy city, the New Jerusalem, the the place that Jesus is going to prepare for us. Everything about it is in preparation to receive it back to a physical place. So there's there's physical properties about this. So to me, and we went over this last time a little bit. I don't want to beat a dead horse, but we talked about this a little bit. And uh, to me, to, because it dwells in this other dimension right now does not mean that you can discount the fact that it's physical in any way. Of course it can be physical. It's just physical in a way that maybe we're not entirely used to, and I think that's maybe what this body is kind of like. It's kind of like it's um, it has physical properties, but it doesn't have the full physicality of what our raptured body is going to be. But because it's dwelling in a place that actually does have physical properties, it has a degree of physical properties. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's how I see it. So, yeah, I do think it's a reasonable thing yeah. to say. Yeah, and last time we did uh, cite numerous examples of, uh, of things that s seem to be uh, physical that we are knowing right now are in the intermediate heaven. For example, Jesus is sitting on a throne next to the Father. And this, these are, we get the picture this is a physical thing. We see Jesus stand up at, uh, when Stephen is, is uh, stoned, and uh, so he's sitting and he stands up and there's a throne. We know that there's smoke coming, of incense coming up in heaven. We know there's, there's numerous examples of physical things. Uh, so uh, I think it's logical to consider at least that this intermediate state has some physical qualities, whether it's just, you know, very, very close to our physical reality or different, I don't know. But as we go through this, these are all things that we have, we can discuss and we can ponder, and we don't have to necessarily have any uh, really strong conclusions about uh, probably maybe any of this. Okay, um, and it says, uh, a fundamental article of the Christian faith is that the resurrected Christ now dwells in heaven. We are told that his resurrected body on earth was physical and that this same physical Jesus ascended to heaven from which he will one day return to earth uh, see Acts 1.11. Oh, you never read that 2 Corinthians to me. Did you find it? Eric? No, I did. I did remember oh, I was about to being caught up. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, so, would you look up, Eric, Acts 1.11? Acts 1.11? Sure. It says, it seems indisputable then to say that there is at least one physical body in the present heaven. That, and that was the point I was trying to make earlier. So we know Jesus was physical. He came back. And there's an interesting take on that, and I want to kind of go over that real quick. Um, but the verse you mentioned, uh, Acts 1.11 says, Which also said, um, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Um, one of the things I notice and there's kind of a play on words there in parts. Is, is people bring up the verse, and I've seen people bring up the verse, well, there's a verse in Scripture that says, flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. But if you pay close attention to Jesus' words when he comes back, he does not say his body has blood. He <coughs> says it's flesh and bone. He does not mention blood. And I believe, it is my belief through study and those verses, that there's a little play on words there to insinuate that blood being what it is in us, um, and the special nature of blood in us as we are now somehow changes in that new body, and we don't have blood. We are flesh and bone, but without blood. I've, I've uh, saw a pretty lengthy teaching on this by Dr. Ruckman, uh, making that very point. Uh, and uh, so maybe we won't need to have blood, but blood does serve a very important purpose, of course. Uh, it transports uh, nutrients, it transports oxygen to all the cells of the body and so on. Uh, so it is important, but maybe the glorified body won't need it. Maybe instead of blood, maybe we'll, we'll, uh, we'll be filled with uh, antifreeze. It's <laughs> anybody's guess. <laughs> oh, like Mr. Spock will be running around with copper blood. <laughs> okay. Uh, is there anybody... It kind of this whole idea you know, it just kind of rubs you wrong about uh, even considering that uh, this intermediate heaven has has some physical qualities to it, and there, and and we would poss could possibly have physical temporary physical bodies while we're there. Is that kind of like 
like just like give you a knee jerk reaction where oh I just don't want to hear something like that because I don't I think Austin was reacted that way last time. <laughs> No, it's the, the the concept of this actually when we started discussing is physicality to me anyway, and everybody else can speak for themselves, but to me, I it always made more sense to me this way. I never had a problem with this. Mm -hmm. Hey, Mitch, have you given this a whole lot of thought in the past? What about heaven? Oh yeah, I think about it all the time. Well, the question of this intermediate heaven and it, whether it says physical qualities and and or not, or, and with the possibility that we could have. Uh, temporary physical bodies until we're resurrected. Have you thought about that, or do you have any? Well, I I ideas? actually open. I'm going to open up a bar up there, Mitch's bar, and, and um, you know, so that this because I believe that you're going to have a physical. You know, you'll be able to taste. Uh, you know, some of the some of the good hooch that I'm going to get. Some of those heavenly spirits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, heavenly spirits. Uh, people say. People talk about getting high, and I say, well, why don't you just get high on the most high? Yeah, well, there, there you go. Well, I, no, I actually have thought about, um, you know, that Jesus came and he, he had, uh, he ate fish with the disciples. He was in his resurrected body. Mm -hmm. But we're going to get a new body, a new heaven, a new, you know, a new heart. I think everything will be new and will be changed in the, in, in the blinking of an eye. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, you know, I kind of, I kind of, Figured well, we're going to have a spiritual body. We're going to be in paradise, mm -hmm. and I don't think that's going to be too bad. I think it's going to be kind of I'll be able to walk with Christ. I'll be able to walk with people, talk with people. You know, I think that there'll be an element there that will be very real. It won't be it won't be existentially like a dream or anything. There'll be something that's that that's that's um, not so much tangible as much as as it's a spiritually fulfilling. Uh, well, last time we talked about uh, Platonism and Gnosticism having the uh, viewpoint that the physical world is basically evil. And in order to not have evil, uh, you have to eliminate all everything that's physical and it must be only spiritual. Uh, does, does the idea of having some uh, physical body or physical realm uh, in heaven, does that... Uh, are you affected by this Platonism or Gnosticism viewpoint? Did you have that kind of a prejudice uh, against physical uh, existence? No, I think that's ridiculous. And the I, I reason why I say that is because when we're in heaven, you know, we won't have that, that what Adam and Eve had. He is the, the answer to the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. He is the answer to the disease that's within our bodies. Mm -hmm. And so he, so in our resurrected body, it will not be like the, this um, this uh, body that is corrupted. Mm -hmm. It's just like the seed that fell to the ground, corruptible. Corruption came, and then it it sprouted out into a new creation. And I think that that's when we die with Christ, we're like that seed. A kernel falls to the ground and dies, and if it dies. It is raised, or it, 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 it comes to life again, and in this case, incorruptibly. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what that uh, funny sound is I'm hearing. Any theories on that? You know, all those little instruments that had, like they use in this uh, in uh, the Caribbean, where they shakers and it makes shaking sound, like a salt <laughs> shaker or something. What is that? Could, does anybody hear about me, or is it? Uh... That, that might have been me. I don't think my. Uh, I thought I had my thing muted. Oh, okay. Well, I, I don't hear it right now, so what, hopefully it will be fixed. But, uh, oh, by the way, Tanya, since you said something, I, I want you to know that b before we started the show, we were talking privately, and I said I want everybody to just. No one's going to be called on when I ask you a question. It's just whoever speaks first talks. So don't feel like. Uh, you know, you need to be called on uh, to to speak. If, if if I ask a question or any, whether even if I don't ask a question, just speak whenever you want. I'd rather have people talking over each other than have the, this horrible. Uh... Yeah. Okay. No problem. Okay. So now he says, um, if Christ's body in the intermediate heaven has physical properties, it stands to reason that others in heaven might have physical forms as well even if only temporary ones. It also makes sense that other aspects of the intermediate heaven would have physical properties. So that, for example, when Christ is standing at the right hand of God, uh, 
would you look up Acts 756? Uh, he is actually standing on something. Otherwise, we would have to conclude that the resurrected and thus embodied Christ has been floating for 2,000 years in a realm without material substance. He could, of course, but does he? If we know there is physical substance in heaven, namely Christ's body, can we not also assume that other references to physical objects in heaven, including physical forms and clothing, are literal rather than physical? That's the question. That's the question. I think we can. I mean, one of the other things before Jesus uh, died, now I know people are going to argue about the timing of it and everything, but he makes the comment, um, drinking wine with the apostles, he says he will not drink of the fruit of the vine again until he drinks it ag again with them together in my father's house. Well, to me, that always meant at the marriage supper when we're reunited again and we're together in heaven, and that's before we ever come back necessarily here, um, that we'll partake in, you know, kind of like what Mitch was saying, there'll be things we'll be partaking in at that time that, are, that feel physical to us, that we taste, we experience our senses. So I do believe there's, there's probably some sort of intermediate... Um, semi-physical form or, or best way to describe it as such uh, in that way. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that you know, even though you guys say that, well, no, I never even heard of or thought about this Platonism and Gnosticism viewpoint, I think it has influenced the church's opinion about heaven. I, I think if you just were to go to a church and start taking a poll asking people to describe heaven, uh, as they see it today, uh, they wouldn't describe it in any physical way. Mm -hmm. I think the vast majority of people would be influenced by Platonism and Gnosticism. I, I agree, too. I think you're right. And the reason I think it is because of the reaction itself. When you see that knee-jerk reaction, the person, the person will have a knee-jerk reaction and then not really sure of the answer to support why exactly they feel that way. It's a very unsure type of answer, but they have that natural hurry-up and say, no, I don't agree with that, but then they don't really have a very realistic or a, a detailed reason as to why they think you can't. Yeah, so that's why I tend to think you're right. I, th I think it, it's just something that's kind of been ingrained in people, and the way Jackson brought it up was he said, well, no, he's never studied Gnosticism or Platonism or anything like that, and that's, that's not, you don't have to. It's just that these principles have kind of been accepted in other ways, in other faiths. Um, they've sort of just carried over and been accepted. Mm -hmm. so yeah, get, what do you? How do you see this? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the way that Randy Alcorn has painted this description of Jesus resurrected with a physical body, his physical body ascending to heaven, and then then him standing in in heaven. But here he is, a physical body standing. Doesn't he have something to stand on? And, and wouldn't, isn't it logical that he's standing on something, and it has to be physical? I mean, you see, some of the things Randy Alcorn shows in his book here is just clearly what scripture says and then some of it is uh, what what the um, through deductive logic you need to conclude by connecting the dots now he, is he right on all his conclusions maybe not but I, I think he presents some pretty interesting ideas for us to consider as we go through this okay how about Enoch and Elijah appear to have been taken to heaven in their physical bodies Quote, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him, unquote. That's Genesis 5.24. Apparently, Enoch's body was not left behind to bury. The Septuagint translated, translates it as, Enoch was not found. Hebrews 11.5 explicitly says that Enoch didn't die. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death, and was not found because God had taken him. Similarly, uh, Elijah was taken to heaven without dying and without having to leave a body behind. Elijah, quote, Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven, and Elisha saw him no more, 2 Kings 2, 11 and 12. And I think it's worth adding to that would be that uh, when, Elisha, when Elijah went up, his chariot, I'm assuming the horses, all went up too. <laughs> and those are physical. That's a good point. Yeah. So, uh, wh how does that? Uh, you know, is this more evidence about this uh, physical uh, realm that that we that exists right now? 
not not in the eternal heaven that we're kind of come to later, but this in this intermediate heaven, this is just more um, information to help us understand that. Well, I've been uh, I, I have before looked at this because I knew a guy who was paralyzed, and he did not want a physical body; he wanted a spiritual body. It was kind of mad when I kind of brought up the idea that we'll have a physical body in heaven because he thought that this body is no good. Why would I want one like it in <laughs> heaven at the time? Of course, you know, so so, so uh, I remember reading over this stuff just for him, you know, and a lot of the stuff that I got was from first, uh, was first Corinthians 15 because there's a huge section on it right in, the, in that chapter. And the whole thing is that uh, Elijah and Elisha, are, are, are Elijah and... Um, and um, uh, Enoch were both taken up to heaven. And I believe that they were also, as Paul says in, in, in 1 Corinthians, changed in the, in, in, the, in the blink of an eye, but given an incorruptible, or you, their body became incorruptible at the time. I don't believe it. I believe it changed, just as Paul said that, that we, will, we will change. As the, the kernel of wheat falls and turns into something else, God gives it a body. As Paul says, you know, birds have a body, man has a body, and there's a spiritual body that we're given. And I, I believe that yeah. that's what we're I think, thinking up there. I think that uh, because Paul uses the term spiritual body, this is confusing a lot of people. They think that it's a spiritual body. It means it, it has no body. It's spirit. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I don't think that's what spiritual body means it, because uh, I, I think it's just as easy to conclude that it, Body is the part. What? What? Why didn't he just say he had his man? It's spirit. No, he had a spiritual body. So he had a body, and it was spiritual, which means that it, there's no sin nature. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a resurrected, glorified body. That's I was just going to. I, I agree with you. I think it speaks to the perfection of that. We know when we accept Christ, and the Holy Spirit comes in to dwell within us. Spiritually, we have become perfected. Spiritually, we're perfected. Our spirit has been perfected, which is why when we die, we lose this imperfected body and we go into the presence of the Lord in spirit because he's done the work to perfect the spirit. Well, then your body will be changed, and, and the, the verse, I think, pertains to this Moses 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 1552, which says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, or the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. It does not say we shall lose our physical forms and stay as spirits like God is. It's, it says we're going to be changed. We're going to be different. Um, and to say a spiritual body, I, I think, means the perfected physical body, like the perfected spirit, and the two become one thing. The two, the yeah. two are now perfect together. I, I think that uh, that term, the word spiritual, describing the body, uh, is the same way Paul talks about spiritual and carnal. Mm -hmm. It's it's spiritual body in that respect. It's not a carnal body. There's no carnality in it because it's it's all and we're spiritual uh, in our resurrected state. Uh, then he poses this question now. He says, okay, given that at least one, that's Jesus, and perhaps three people, that now you include Elijah, Elijah and uh, Enoch, uh, at least three people now have bodies in heaven. Isn't it possible that others might have, be given physical forms as well? Uh, not only, I, I would get a step further than him, I would say, isn't it likely? I mean, why would only Jesus, Enoch, and, uh, and uh, Elijah... Uh, have the three physical bodies, but everybody else does not have the physical body. Was it in Ezekiel where the bones were raised, the dry bones? Can these bones live? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that that's uh, an excellent picture. Uh, but I really do believe that a lot of people are, they are confused at this. And I think it is uh, important to bring this out because I think that they don't really understand I, I think that they think that heaven's supposed to be this great thing, but I don't think they really know how great it is because I think they think they're going to be floating around and it's going to be this, you know, it might not be as great as they thought it was, you know? Yeah. Uh, we, in the first episode, we talked about people, a lot of people actually say, uh, why would I want to go to heaven? It'll be boring, you know, just, just nothing but, but prayer meetings and Bible studies and church services and choirs and stuff. And that doesn't appeal to a lot of people, even a lot of Christians. The idea of, of being like that in eternity is not very appealing. So, uh, but we know as we go through this, we're going to discuss, you know, what 
life will be like for us in eternity, and it's not going to be like that, that at all. Um, okay, so now we're learning that uh, uh, at least Jesus, Enoch, uh, Enoch, and Elijah have physical bodies in this uh, in intermediate heaven. Now, it says Moses and Elijah appeared physically with Christ at the transfiguration. Uh, how about, uh, uh, Mitch, do you have a Bible there? I do have a Bible. Okay, I, I, could, I actually found it. Would you, would you, I know you own one because I know you showed it to me once. Uh, <laughs> Luke, look up Luke 9, verse 28 through 36. And uh, Randy goes on to say, because they had already gone to heaven, Moses having died and Elijah having been taken from earth in a whirlwind, if souls in intermediate heaven are disembodied, God would have had to create temporary bodies for them when they came from heaven to be with Jesus on the mountain. If so, they would have gone from being disembodied to embodied, and after the transfiguration become disembodied again to wait the final resurrection. Now you see how another example, uh, he's using deductive logic, you know, kind of connecting the dots here to come to conclusions, or at least forming hypothesis. Is this, is, is this a, a logical possibility? You, do you have that, Mitch? Yeah, I do, but I want to go from 27. Okay, go ahead. But I tell you truly, there are some of those standing here who shall not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. And some eight days after these sayings, it came about that he took along Peter and John and James and went up to the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face became different, and his clothing became white and gleaming. And behold, two men were talking with him, and they were Moses and Elijah, who appearing in glory were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions had been overcome with sleep, but when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. And it came about, as these were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, is it good for us to be here? And let us make three, uh, three tabernacles, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not realizing what he was saying. And while he was saying this, a cloud formed and began to overshadow them. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and reported to no one in those days any of the things which they had seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, there, there's a lot, of, a lot of great things that can be gleaned from that. Uh, um, but related to what we're talking about right now, physical bodies in the intermediate heaven what do you what do you conclude that he was walking and talking I mean they were walking and talking with one another as if they had bodies yeah and what are they referred to as hold on let me look it over again to put my glasses on for that da -da 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 -da. and behold two men were talking with him to men. Yes. I mean, you know, when you refer to someone as a man, um, it, it seems to me if they were just sent like disembodied spirits, they, they, they would have been described as uh, the spirit of Moses. Didn't it say the spirit of uh, Samuel came to uh, uh, Saul? Saul, oh, the witch of Endor, yes. Yeah, so it was a spirit. So when a spirit comes, it, the Bible says it's a spirit. But these, mm -hmm. these were not called spirit of Moses. It said these two men. And we think of men as being physical. So uh, there's nothing in there to give us any indication that this is not a physical um, state that, that Moses and... and uh, Bring it on back. Uh-oh. Might have lost him. I'll have to log back on again. I hope he's not still talking. <laughs> okay, he just he just joined the call, so uh, uh -huh. you're back. 
Yeah, oh, God. Were you raptured? <laughs> were you in a physical body when you? Were... Uh, <laughs> yeah. You, you, probably, you guys. Third? You guys probably thought they, that I got raptured like you not here, didn't you? <laughs> Tanya, did you think that? Yes. <laughs> She's like yes. <laughs> Okay, I'm trying to get my, uh, what do you call my clone off of here. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's weird. When that happened, it actually told me I had to sign back in. So good thing I know my password, huh? Um, okay, so did I miss anything? Uh, did anybody have anything to say about this idea? Here he's presenting Moses and Elijah as another example of people in heaven and they come down to have this conversation with Jesus, and it's witnessed by uh, Peter, John, and James, isn't it? Uh, and uh, and they're uh, they're observing them and re referred to as men. So mm -hmm. this is just another uh, building the case of examples of physical beings in 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 heaven already. There's something else in there that uh, it's a different subject, but I think it's worth mentioning briefly, and that is that uh, the idea of the Trinity versus modalism is also uh, this a good argument here for uh, Trinitarianism because you have Jesus uh, on the Mount, uh, the Transfiguration, he's there, and then you have the voice of the Father, and this shows that there's two distinct persons here uh, rather than uh, one person that simply changes back and forth from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So uh, that's another good, uh, I think, proof text for tra uh, Trinitarianism. Okay. Okay, now, uh, uh, Randy says, a, another possibility is that Moses and Elijah came to earth in the same temporary bodies they already had in heaven. Uh, uh, in Elijah's case, his temporary body might even have been his original earthly body, which never died. If Moses and Elijah came to earth with the same temporary bodies they had in heaven, they could have returned to heaven just as they were. Did their joining Christ on earth require them to become something else, or did it simply involve their coming somewhere else? Uh, was it that they were temporarily embodied or merely temporarily relocated. I vote. I vote for temporarily relocated, not temporarily bought embodied. Like in other words, he's saying we know that we we can conclude that they had a body on the, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah. Mm -hmm. So what are we going to assume that they had a body in a heaven and their their body was relocated to have this conversation with Jesus, or are we to assume that? Uh, in heaven, they did not have a body, but when they're talking to Jesus, they were temporarily given a body to talk to him, which is more logical, I guess. Well, I don't know which is which, but I, I would say that they, it is possible that they got a temporary resurrected body just for this experience. Mm -hmm. You know what keeps coming to my mind, and I don't know if this has anything to do with this or not, but I keep thinking about how, you know, it says that we're going to put on incorruption you know, and all of that. So, like, in other words, we could look at that as putting on our new bodies that's not corrupt, right? And it makes me think about how when Adam and Eve sinned, how he put on clothing for them, like made clothing for them. So if he did it for them, then I guess it would make sense that he would give us new bodies to put on in heaven. Mm-hmm. Um... Yeah, that's a very good point here. Let me see what's this. You know, when I got kicked off my own show here a minute ago, it threw off a bunch of things. i got to reset something here real quick. Hang on. One more thing here. <laughs> you know, I noticed that, you know, lately Tanya hasn't been talking that much. But when she does speak... It's so profound. Well, uh, putting on, putting on incorruption, putting on uh, this uh, clothing. Uh, Paul referred to it as uh, 
putting on, I think we talked about this in what, one of the previous episodes on heaven, and Randy Alcorn was talking about it's not natural for a human being to not have a body. And Paul was talking about I did, he didn't want to be naked. He, he yearned to not be naked. He wanted to have a body. I didn't want to have just a, a spirit, and uh, so it's. Uh, I think that's a very good point you made there. That uh, uh, putting on incorruption. Incorruption just just means uh, the best example I can give you is it talked about that, that Jesus when he was after he died he would not suffer corruption. In other words, his body would not uh, rot in the grave. Uh, and the, the idea of rotting and incorruption is death. So when you put on incorruption, it means that you don't don't have death, you don't die, you have immortality. Im immortality and incorruption are probably interchangeable in that case. So uh, yeah, I think that that's a very good point you made there. That uh, uh, putting on a body. We also do that in the womb too, like when we're being you know made or whatever. We start off as this little tiny little thing and then we slowly start putting on flesh and then bones and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, just thinking out loud. <laughs> yeah, very good. I think only a mother could think of that one though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, um, the physical presence of Moses and Elijah at the Transfiguration seems uh, to demonstrate beyond question that God at least sometimes creates intermediate bodies for people to inhabit prior to the resurrection of the dead, even if only for Moses and Elijah, and only while they were on earth. The question is whether these temporary bodies were granted only to Moses and Elijah while they were on the mountain, or whether temporary bodies are granted to everyone in the intermediate heaven. That's the question. And that's the case he's trying to build. Obviously, Randy Elkhorn has a, an opinion on this. And he's building the case to support his opinion, and uh, we're, we're considering it. So, is anybody uh, enlightened from this so far? And uh, maybe are you being persuaded that maybe this is a real possibility? I'm still thinking of running my bar up there. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to run a bar, like an Irish bar restaurant. Call it mix, you know. <laughs> Next intermediate, intermediate Irish, Irish pub. Yeah. Well, you know, as we go through this, we're going to find out that we're going to enjoy food and we're going to enjoy all kinds of things in, in eternity. <clears throat> but I don't know if we're going to really feel a need to, to be high on alcoholic spirits. Because well, I'll be serving Jesus wine. Yeah, we're going to be, but we're going to be getting high. I won't water it down either, believe me. <laughs> I think we'll probably be constantly high on uh, the Spirit of God and His glory. Uh, I've, I've compared it. I, I'm going to kind of censor what I'm saying because I'm in private. I've said this a different way before. But let me just say, think of the most exhilarating uh, times of your life, the, the times where you had the most, it was the most pleasure, the most wonderful feeling of your life. And then multiply that times a million and make it a constant state. And that's what I expect in eternity. I got that biting into an Italian ice in the summertime. Oh. <laughs> Lemon oh. Italian ice in the summer. Oh. And it kind of gave me instant brain freeze. And it was just, oh, the heat around me and the ice. Oh. Oh. Watermelon yeah. flavor. Uh, I, I got to go with the lemon ice. I'm with Mitch. I got to go with the Italian lemon ice on that one. That was a traditional thing for us Italians. You know, we did the Italian. But no, you know, something Mitch was, Mitch was talking about, and it's both. You know, I don't believe, I think you're both correct. I think you're both correct. We'll consume these things, but it won't be for the purposes people consume these things on earth. I mean, we will consume these things without the worry of getting drunk. We'll, we'll consume them purely for the pleasure of the taste or purely for the experience of it. One of the things that I would have a very hard time believing that God would just make make us spirits is because one of the most quintessential things that makes us human and a sharing thing as humans is touch. Um, it's a very special special thing. And to put you into a form where you couldn't touch each other or embrace each other, I think it takes a one, away one of the fundamental things that God made for humans to to relate to one another, whether it's a hug or just a touch on the hand, or it's a very special thing. You see that all through Scripture, that the touch, laying one of hands, 
it, it, it's something very personal. And to me, to take away from that by saying, well, we'd all be spirits and our physical can't touch things anymore and things like that, it just doesn't make any sense to me. That's a good point. You see, Tanya's not the only one that has a brilliant comment. Now, <laughs> Mitch is probably feeling bad because he's never got any applause yet. I don't need applause. I don't know. I, I kind of liked his his uh, Irish bar and grill. <laughs> uh, so Mitch says that we'll be he's going to open up a bar, a pub in heaven. <laughs> there you go. I'll take the last thing. <laughs> Worthy of a good laugh. Okay. Uh, we're going to go into something now that I originally thought I would avoid because uh, I don't want to open up a can of worms. I already talked about it. Remember we did the series or the, the topic a couple of shows back about uh, eternal torment and, and all that. And we talked about Lazarus. and I don't want to open up that can of worms again, but let's, let's talk about Lazarus. But let's talk about it uh, only in the perspective of the, um, uh, the physical body in paradise or heaven here. So we'll use it for that purpose. Um, so it says, what can we learn from the rich man and Lazarus? Now, uh, some people can argue vehemently, vehemently that uh, this is a parable and it's not a real story, it's just, but, and other people argue the other side that it's, just, it's a story of an actual event. So let's look at it in that light for this purpose. He's, it says, in the New Testament account of the rich man and Lazarus, Jesus ascribes physical properties to people who have died. Uh, it says, there was a rich man, this is Luke 16, verses 19 through 31. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, quote, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, uh, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have fifteen, oh, fifteen. For I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, "They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them." No, Father Abraham, he said. But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, "If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets." they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. So uh, Randy Alcorn has a lot to say about this. Before we get into his comments, let's just see what your reaction to that is pertinent to the idea of a physical reality in physical bodies. Now this is talking about what place? Just talking about Hades. Hades. Sure. And um, uh, could anybody want to describe uh, Hades as it? Well, actually, this actually describes it, doesn't it? It has two mm -hmm. compartments. Mm -hmm. One is called Paradise. The other is called Torments. Torments. The entire area is referred to as Hades. Mm -hmm. And so you have a place for uh, people who are waiting for Jesus to pay for their sins and come and take them into this heaven. And it has the people who uh, are in Torments who are not going to be saved. Now, uh, so this is kind of like a... Temporary play, temporary jail for the uh, the lost before they get sent to the uh, the lake of fire at the final judgment, uh, and, and and it's a temporary place for the Old Testament saints uh, before they get to go to the the next heaven, uh, which is the current state right now of these people. Uh, so that's the that's the description of the place. But what do we gain from this? Uh, in terms of understanding the physical reality of it all. 
Well, while in this place, they are physical. They feel and experience physical things. They experience heat, thirst. They see each other. They speak to each other. These are physical things being described here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, water, cool, tongue, finger. Uh, if, this is, if this really describes uh, people in paradise and in torments, then they have physical bodies because that's, that's just, it's describing a physical uh, reality. Okay, I'll tell you what Randy Elkren, how he uses this uh, to make the case. Some people believe this story is nothing more than a parable intended to convey a central idea about the after-death consequences of our choices made on earth. They believe that Lazarus and the rich man were not real people and that references to fire, thirst, finger, and tongue are not intended as physical realities. I certainly don't believe that every biblical account should be take, taken literally, uh, uh, and I certainly agree that uh, there is much figurative language in this passage. However, I also think it's a mistake to dismiss the parable as strictly figurative based on assumptions that the afterlife consists of disembodied people in a non-physical realm. Now he goes on to say Jesus could easily have portrayed the rich man and Lazarus in other ways. He could have said when Lazarus died his spirit drifted without a body into a realm without sin and pain. But he didn't. It seems unlikely that Jesus would have depicted the afterlife in such concrete detail if he had nothing to teach us concerning the nature of heaven and hell. Yeah, I'm sitting here thinking, like, what if what if it really is all figurative and it's not none of it's well, to be taken literally? But because I think about how he's longing for his um, brothers to you know, know come to know the truth and all of that. So what if it's just that you have desires and stuff like that, um, and he, that's not physical? But then he mentions thirst. Well, here's yeah. the problem I have with that mindset and. This is where you got to sometimes take a take a step back and look at things. If you look at every other parable that Jesus talks about, this par this story, it's not a parable. This story is presented in a very different way. Jesus uses specific names of specific individuals and puts specific words in these individuals' mouths. Now, if Abraham, who we know existed and existed afterwards, didn't say these things, Jesus would be lying when he says he said these things. Jesus doesn't lie. So there's no way I believe this is a parable. Mm -hmm. um, he's talking about individ specific individuals and putting words in these individuals' mouths. He's not... Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> whether, it, whether it is a parable or not, Randy Elkhorn makes the point that uh, even if it was a parable, why would Jesus explain this uh, uh, afterlife state in, these, in that way? Wouldn't he, wouldn't he be more... Uh, correct and and honest if he had explained it the way he gave in the second choice these disembodied spirits are in in to torments and and you know why describe it like they have physical bodies why give us this impression that there are physical bodies there if that's not the case so uh, wouldn't wouldn't that be wrong for Jesus to do that yes yeah I agree with that and I like Eric's point there he wouldn't have used specific names unless he was talking about those people. That did it for me. Let me That's ask you point. this then. I think Randy goes into this. Uh, well, I think I, I'm not covering all of that on this part here. But um, do, you, do you think that the, uh, this Lazarus is uh, the Lazarus that Jesus raised from the dead? Could they be the same one? He was a rich man. He was dead for three days. Uh, Jesus resurrected him. Could well, it, well, well, wait a minute. Well, Lazarus wasn't rich. I mean, this Lazarus that he's talking about wasn't the Lazarus was a poor man in this story. So the Lazarus, he was a beggar. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's the exact opposite. So that couldn't yeah. be the case. Thank you. Matter of fact, I think that uh, uh, yeah, the part I neglected to read from Randy Elkhorn's book makes that same point. Now I recall. <laughs> so, so. Also, I think I, I'm pretty sure Lazarus was probably a pretty common name back then too, kind of like how John is common, kind of thing. Yeah. Even uh, Jesus was a common name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll uh, skip ahead a bit. Says uh, He says, um, 
page 63, the bottom, it says, In the intermediate heaven or hell, we will await the time that Jesus foretold, uh, quote, when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good will rise to life, those who have done evil will rise to be condemned, unquote. That's John 5, 28, 29. Until that day comes, Scripture teaches that those who die will go to a real place, either the present heaven or the present hell. As conscious human beings with memory and their lives and relationships on earth, those in hell will live in misery, hopelessness, apparent isolation, while those in heaven will live in comfort, joy, and rich relationship with God and others. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we're going to begin uh, this chapter 7 now. Uh, at any point, if I go on, and uh, before you get a chance to say something, just stop me. Uh, he asked this question, what is, the, what is life like in the intermediate heaven? Um, David Lloyd George is a quote from him, whoever he is. When I was a boy, the thought of heaven used to frighten me more than the thought of hell. I pictured heaven as a place where place where time would be perpetual Sundays with perpetual services from which there would be no escape. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Well, well I, you know what the well, funny part about that is? I want to interrupt you real quick. Look, I'm sorry, but the funny part about that is some people believe that that's the state that we're supposed to live in today. We're supposed to be in a perpetual state of never doing anything except exactly. about – Something with God and the Lordship Salvationists, of course, we talk about them often, but there's some of those people. It seems like if you're not eating, living, breathing, this is all you ever do and all you ever talk about, that something's wrong with you in this life. And you, and that's not true. God def, ex, certainly expects us to do other things. He expects us to hold jobs. He expects us to take time for our family. He expects us to have fun. He expects, I mean, he doesn't, it's not, he doesn't expect us to be in this you know, perpetual state like they are of feeling bad about everything you do. <laughs> I mean, and it, it's not supposed to be that way. I'd like, to, I'd like to expound upon that because while we were on, I had a video downloading about Sorry Christianity where there's these people, these, these Judaizers, and I can understand them because their whole life is about being penitent before the Lord. Their whole life is being in Sunday school or being in church all the time, constantly repenting all the time. So if it's more of the same up in heaven, what do they have to look forward to? Constantly feeling sorry all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I think this is a very important uh, subject to discuss for a minute here. And the, the um, there are people, and there's people on YouTube. Some people I really like very much, but it seems that they are um, overemphasizing this spirituality of a Christian. Uh, at, at the cost of everything else in life. For example, I've seen some people make videos saying it's horrible to even watch the Super Bowl. It's horrible to own or watch a television set. It's, and, and that all of our time, all of our thought needs to be going into ministry and, and, and just you know, uh, promoting the kingdom of God. And, and um, look, the, the four of us, we love to talk about Jesus. Did, did anybody uh, force you to attend this hangout? Nope. Nope. You're here because you want to be here, because you love talking about Jesus, you love the scriptures, you love fellowship with the brethren, and, and it, it's because what we love to do. Uh, but it, but there is more to life. I've actually seen some people, so there are some famous people, that have gotten their life so out of balance with spirituality, their lives are so completely dedicated to their ministry that their children never got to know them. Their wives were neglected. Their health was neglected because they went didn't keep things balanced. And uh, that's one thing Paul says is that maybe uh, you know maybe you, you need to get married because uh, you have uh, you have a sex drive. You need a, a to do, have that uh, used within a marriage, and, and if you uh, if you get married, 
then you have to understand that you can't put all your time into Jesus. You know, you've got to give time to your wife and your children and so on. So uh, those people who have marriages and families and relationships and jobs and need to provide an income for themselves and their families, there are there is more to our life uh, than than complete ministry all the time. Even though that's what we love to do. Uh, I, I love the amount of time I'm spending on YouTube and witnessing to people and fellowship with you guys. Um, and I would probably do more of it if, 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 as opportunities come up. I don't ever really turn down that opportunity. You know, I get phone calls from people sometimes, and uh, we we talk about Jesus. And, and so I, it's not like I, I'm doing it as an obligation and a duty. As, as I am, must do it. I do it because I like to do it. And I, that's, I know that's why you guys should do it. But on the other hand, I still enjoy playing golf. I still enjoy watching TV, and and that doesn't make me any less righteous than someone that that, that took the TV and gave it away or, or threw it in the garbage can. I, I was going to ask you the same the same thing. You you don't feel obligated, whereas these people who feel as if God has done this for me and I'm obligated to do this for Him. Yeah. I mean, and then they they say, well, I shouldn't feel begrudged, but it, it's got to give you a sense of, of, of having a grudge, because yes. you're, you're, you're obligated and you're not free. I mean, Mitch, Mitch, you just took the words right out of my mouth. I was going to say the same thing. It becomes a grudging act. It becomes something that as a human, you're going to start to, well, well, and you see the result. Look at the quote. Um, when I was a boy, I thought the thought of heaven used to frighten me because you thought you're going to be a perpetual state of doing this. Well, obviously, this is not something enjoyable for you then, or else you wouldn't have felt that that perpetual state of doing it was bad. So, <laughs> obviously, you're not enjoying yourself now, so it must be a grudging thing that you're doing now. You're not really doing it because you want to do it. You're doing it because you feel obligated to do it. Um, That's why I make videos, and I read the whole book of Revelations today. Did it, was it a burden to me? No, I was like, oh, I gotta figure this out. I just this is what I do because I know Christ and I I love to do it. And if I don't feel like doing it, guess what? I don't do it. But <laughs> those, those two things. He's exactly right. And those two things, I find they breed these two things most often: pride and self destruction. That attitude breeds those two things more than anything else because you build yourself up for a fall. You wind up doing all these things and feeling like you're building your little house of cards and when it comes tumbling down and something goes wrong where you're a prideful person who walks about feeling like you've done more than everybody else because you've so obligated yourself to do all these things that when something does go wrong, a lot of these people have a very hard time rebounding and they and they never have a good relationship with the Lord because they're constantly in doubt because when something does go wrong, they feel like their whole life's coming down. And, and this is the whole reason for what I do trying to free people from the Lordship salvation and all the doctrines that they blindly run into. And like I said, I talked to you guys before, I might be talking to the, to, to the air with some people, but when other people watch it, I want them to, be, to have, a, have a freedom in Christ, not bondage. Amen. Yeah, a lot of people, you're right, are under the impression that God just created us to, you know, be on our knees 24/7 or live in some monastery, you know, like a monk or something. But that's not the case. And and what makes me think of that is remember how uh, when God created the animals and stuff like that, He actually brought all the animals to Adam and said, hey Adam, you name these animals. God could have named them, he created them. But he gave, he, he's like, here, you do it. You know what I mean? I just think that's cool. So, And that goes to show that he didn't create us just to be on our knees all the time. He, he created us to interact with us, to give us <laughs> liberties and, you know, to, to have a nice yeah. life. Yeah, he made pizza and Italian ices. He made, you know. That's absolutely. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> he, he made this world as vast and as large as it is, do you, if we sat around in our, like like Tanya put it beautifully, in our, in our little monasteries all day long, and we never went anywhere, did anything, and experienced this vast world God created, which he told us to experience, which is why he made it to begin with, don't you think he'd have made a world about the size of a uh, one city so that we didn't have to go very far, and we could just sit in that one place and just sit in our monastery all day long on our knees and just do that all day long? Yeah, I mean, he, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. 
Okay, this is for all of you. Amen. Okay, um, so he says, um, Randy Elkhorn says, that we can learn a great deal about the intermediate heaven from three key verses in Revelation. This is Revelation 6, verses 9, 10, and 11. Uh, when the Lamb opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed." Unquote. Um, Rennie Alcorn says, I offer here 21 brief observations concerning this passage. So he thinks there's 21 important things to, to derive from those three verses. That's a lot, huh? Mm. Wow. Um, well, before we go into what Randy says, what's you guys' uh, first impression on that related to uh, to the study? Well, that there's a time of everybody they're waiting for the last people or the last martyrs to come in before this judgment happens. Mm -hmm. And he gives them a physical thing. He gives them a white robe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, his first point, he says, when these people died on earth, they relocated to heaven. That's in verse 9. In other words, they are in heaven now. Mm -hmm. um, and then, when is this happening, though? I guess, I guess these martyrs could have been from uh, Stephen. Stephen was the first martyr. Uh, it could have been Stephen. It could have been Peter. It could have been Paul. Maybe, maybe Probably the prophets. Martyrs. Or the maybe prophets the, before Stephen, right. um, you know, all the all the all the all the ones that prophesied about Christ that were killed for Christ's sake. Yeah, I mean, the, all of these Old Testament saints who were martyrs, and then of course the apostles and the early church saints that were all so many uh, martyrs, and even today, maybe it's them. But I'm wondering if this is more particular to the people in the tribulation who are martyred. Uh, well, I guess we'll discuss this as we go along here. Okay, so but the important thing is to know that, uh, that in this intermediate heaven, before the eternal heaven, that's when the, where these people are. Okay? Uh, point number two, he says, these people in heaven were the same ones killed for Christ while on earth. That's in verse 9. This demonstrates direct continuity between our identity on earth and our identity in heaven. The martyrs' personal history extends directly back to their lives on earth. Those in the intermediate heaven are not different people. They are the same people relocated. Righteous men made perfect, it says in Hebrews 12.23. So that's, uh, in other words, a lot of people think that, uh, you know, somehow you become a different person when you, when you go to heaven. Hello? Uh, but... Uh, I th we're going to go into this in much more detail later, but you know, one of the things that, that determines who we are is our memories. If you had no memory, it really wouldn't be you. And this is an example of somebody, they're crying out in, about a memory. Look, we were killed in, for, your, for your namesake, and when are you going to avenge this? this? And so they have a memory of that. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's, that points out that they are the same people. Uh, this third point he says, people in heaven will be remembered for their lives on earth. These were known and identified as one slain, quote, because of the testimony they had maintained. Aren't the people who are martyred, don't they also get some kind of special reward too or some kind of special crown just for people mm -hmm. who are killed or something like that? Yeah, yeah, they do. I don't remember where it is, but I believe there are five different crowns that are, are cited in scriptures, and one is the crown of a martyr for a martyr. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to get my head cut off for that. That that'd be nice to get that crown. Yeah. 
it doesn't hurt to get your head cut off unless you do it with a, like the way Muslims do it, you know, because they go like saw it off slowly. But but if you get guillotined or something like that, or like Paul, Paul and John the Baptist, it's just one swift blow, and it's just I guess it's painless, Mitch. I, you know, and I heard that some people stay alive for a little bit afterwards so I can wink at them. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> okay. Give a smile. Okay, now. Don't be so creepy. <laughs> point number four. It says, quote, they called out, unquote, verse 10. That means they are able to express themselves audibly. This could suggest they exist in physical form with vocal cords or other tangible means to express themselves. <clears throat> so again, he's, he's still making this case, giving us like proof texts uh, for the idea that the people in the intermediate heaven have a physical reality. It's not just a spirit realm. And the point five says people in the intermediate heaven can raise their voices in verse 10. This indicates that they are rational, communicative, and emotional, even passionate beings, like people on Earth. Of course, you know, I, I never raise my voice. I never get excited like that. <laughs> well, a couple of times I have. I guess you can find a few videos where I get a little irate. No. <laughs> I've never seen Mitch get angry. I, I've seen him get perturbed, but never reach the level of, like anger. That's when I shut the camera off. <laughs> right. I know because you're very concerned about your image, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I'm very concerned. That's why I say the things I do. So everybody will love me. <laughs> okay. If anybody watches what I what the things that I say, you would not get that impression. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, and the sixth point he says they called out in quote a loud voice not loud voices individuals speaking with one voice indicate that heaven is a place of unity and shared perspective uh, the next point is the martyrs are fully conscious rational and aware of each other God and the situation on earth Wow aware of the situation on earth there's a new little thing to consider too we're going to be discussing that and much more. A lot of the points that we go through, just we touch on as we go through this, there's an entire chapter on that one point coming up later. So it's pretty exciting to, for me to look forward to those things. Yeah, I think that just going back to the different crowns thing, that proves right there that it's not like complete unity. Or there wouldn't be separate crowns for, you know, the people who are martyred and, you know, stuff like that. Well, unity doesn't mean... Uh, do, um, distinctions. Uh, everybody's not going to be equal. They don't have the same crowns, the same treasures, the same rewards. Those are based upon the works we did as ministers for Christ. And and uh, so in that way, they're not equal, but and yet they're unified in their thought, in their, in their, um, this, in this case at least. Right. Uh, it says, uh, they ask God to intervene on earth and to act on their behalf. Quote, how long until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? So, <laughs> oh, so, so they have a concept of time, too, which oh, is absolutely. revenge. Absolutely. They're certainly, I've always accepted they're certainly aware of the events that are going on on earth. Yeah. I mean, obviously, they're aware because they know their blood has not been avenged yet at that point. And so, yeah, and they're... Uh, they have feelings too. I guess they want their blood avenged. Yeah, I understand that you forgive people, you know, to a certain degree, but um, you know, there might be a, a certain amount of of, uh, of righteous indignity, you know, indignant. It's not indignity, it's just being righteously indignant for for what had happened. Mm -hmm. This next point is exciting to me. It says those in heaven are free to ask God questions. <laughs> which means they have an audience with God. It also means they need to learn. In heaven, people desire understanding and pursue it. My, one of my happiest things in life is, is as we discuss these things and we, I learn more, uh, 
I learn a lot more than I teach, and and it, it every time I learn something, uh, it it's just wonderful. I, I think you guys probably get the same kind of excitement from a, another revelation, whether it's the Holy Spirit or whether it's a brother or sister that says something and you you get a new understanding. Is that's just exciting. So this is saying that we're free to ask God questions. How do you think about that? Well, imagine, imagine if uh, you knew everything. Wouldn't it be kind of boring? Yeah, I thought that about God. I'm saying, I wonder if God gets bored knowing everything. I mean, to me, one of the exciting things is learning something. And if, if I already know everything, I don't need to learn anything. Uh, <laughs> have you ever thought about that? Well, I don't know that God gets bored. I, I'm sure that, that, that <coughs> he's got everything in perpetuation and he's enjoying his creation. And he's enjoying the time that that, that he has uh, yeah. with us. I think he's so much bigger than we are that you know I, I think he's got a lot of things to uh, to keep him occupied, even even with knowing everything. Mm -hmm. But as I, far I, as heaven is concerned, I don't want to know everything. I do want things to do. Although God could make me a beautiful palace, I'd rather you give me the stones and give me the mortar and give me a hat and a. And, and, and uh, give me a sandwich and uh, and a heavenly beer. I'll take that and I'll sit down and I'll build your I'll build it for you. Jesus could come by and say, "Hi, how you doing? Oh, I'm building this wall here. What do you think about this? Oh, well, I think you should put this down." Like, oh, okay. And I'll learn things for a moment. He'll show me how to become a better mason. I don't really want to know everything in heaven. I just want I want that what I want in heaven is what. It, I perceive it to be as a place where everybody will get along, money will not be an issue, and and there'll be no hate for anybody else, and we'll actually kind of live without having the worries of money and 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 work and and jobs and if I'm going to lose it or raising the kids or or, or or even profanity. It'll be a place where everybody will like jive. They'll get along. That's good enough for me eternally. That's fine. Mm -hmm. I think there's another side to that too. I think, and I think Mitch is right. It's like it's, and and then there's always there's always knowing everything, quote unquote. That, you know, everything is relative. I mean, there's a lot to everything. I mean, and and living in the here and now. Uh, as human beings, we kind of get caught up in the in the mindset that this is the learning process, but it's really not. We're only in life. We're in like the acknowledgement section of the book. We're not even in the beginning chapters of the book. We're we, not until we till you know God comes and the eternity and eternity starts. Are we really beginning the true learning and the true understanding that we're going to get? So it's like we're we're in the very beginning stages of this whole thing. This is the small part. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, we could all say what we're looking forward to, but in, in, in Revelation it says there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain, uh, obviously no more sickness, and those are the kind of things that you know I look forward to. I've had a lot of little health things I've had to deal with, and getting older is is painful. <laughs> so. Uh, um, we all have reasons, our own reasons for looking forward to eternity, but the interesting thing is uh, Mitch, you don't have to worry about ever knowing it all because we're never going to be omniscient like God, but we're going to learn forever. And your point, Eric, about uh, we're being we're in the forward or what it was the in, the acknowledgments or introduction to the to the book. Yeah, if you look at a lifetime, let's say eighty years, uh, that's not even a grain of sand on in a, in a ter our eternal state. And then not only our lifetime, but just the whole existence of of, of from Adam until uh, the new heavens and the new earth begins, uh, that whole time is like a grain of sand in eternity. Eternity. So we're going to go on learning and enjoying uh, each other and God. And it, it's just it's mind-boggling to me. Huh? It'll be like the two on the road to Amas all the time. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I just... You're you're living your life doing it. I, I'm 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 out in the in the air building my thing, and all of a sudden, Jesus comes by and says, "Oh, let's, let's sit and talk for a little bit." Oh yeah, what's going on? Oh well, you remember back at this time, and and, and remember when it said this in the scriptures? This is what we I was trying to show, and this is the meaning. And so I'm like, 
oh yeah, yeah, you know, and and I think that that, that, that those kind of conversations are just going to go on endlessly, and they'll be interesting. You know. Yeah, that is really exciting to me, and and you know when Jesus talks to you and he has that chat with you, maybe he'll he probably won't give you a beer, Mitch, but maybe he'll give you a glass of wine or something. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't understand. Is beer is beer somehow evil? I, I, I you well, know, if I can't get drunk up there, if I can only get this giddy uh, Holy Spirit beer, you know, you know, it doesn't get me drunk. It might actually get me a little giddy, but never get me like out of control. Like you can get drunk on wine. You know, Jesus only drank wine. He didn't drink any beer. I don't know that that's true. They called him a wine bibber, but I think he might have did a couple shots too. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh boy. I mean, a good rye whiskey. I mean, it's natural. It comes. Okay, and the ninth point is those in heaven. Oh, um, the tenth point: people in the intermediate heaven know what's happening on earth. The martyrs know enough to realize that those who killed them have not yet been judged. I'm wondering how much they really know about what's going on on Earth. I mean, we know here's one example of something they know. But have you ever wondered if your <coughs> your loved ones uh, in heaven now are able to observe you? And then I have if, wondered that. And then if they are observing you, can they observe you all the time? And I hope not. <laughs> yeah, and and if, and if they are observing you all the time, wouldn't they? Imagine cry? going up there and going. Would, would, I would, saw you. <laughs> they're like all embarrassed, about, you know. Yes, I mean they'd be so embarrassed by us, and they'd be crying, or they'd be ashamed of us sometimes, you know. <laughs> I wouldn't want them to know everything. <laughs> yes, my uncle Joe watching now. But sorry, Joe. <laughs> yeah, and let me see. Point eleven. He says, "Heaven dwellers have a deep concern for justice and retribution." Uh, when we go to heaven, we won't adopt a passive and disinterest in what happens on the earth. On the contrary, our concerns will be more passionate and our thirst for justice greater. Neither God nor we will be satisfied until his enemies are judged, our bodies raised, sin and Satan defeated, earth restored, and Christ exalted over all. Yeah. Hmm. We're groaning just like the whole world is groaning for this to happen. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I find it not only interesting uh, what he's saying here, but that he can draw so much, so many conclusions out of these three verses, and he, there's there's much more he for, for, he has to say on this. Uh, that's what you call expounding on the scriptures, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it says the martyrs clearly remember their lives on earth. Verse 10 says, they even remember that they were murdered. So some people say, well, gee, I, there's certain things on earth that I, wish, I wouldn't want to remember. But if anything you want to forget, it seems like being murdered, being martyred, especially some of these martyrs, their deaths were not that easy. I mean, and if you ever read Fox's Book of Martyrs, the, the graphic descriptions of the horrible, torturous deaths of saints throughout history, uh, would they want to remember that? I don't. It's one I, thing I've wondered about is, um, you know, because I've always thought that you know, once we get to heaven and and all of our corruption is is taken away and you know we're in this perfect bodies and stuff like that, if we do remember our sin, because and then I wonder if remembering the stuff that we've done, the sin, does that that itself make us corrupt. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense? Well, I think the second part is easy to answer. It would not make us corrupt, uh, uh, re remembering it. And perhaps we will, because here, here, here's an example. I mean, they, they remember that they were martyred. Uh, mm -hmm. And then if you do take away our memories, you're taking our identity and we're no longer ourselves. Uh, our, our memories and our all those experiences, that, that really constitutes who we are as people. Yeah, I think a lot of people think that we lose our memories up in heaven. Like we don't yeah. remember anything. We don't want to remember everything because it was so bad. But I think I, in, our, in, our, in our resurrected bodies 
and our resurrected mind, I think we'll probably see it from a much different perspective. I'm glad Mitch said that. I was that's exactly what I was gonna say. I think people people lose sight of the fact that you're you're thinking about things now as a person that you are not going to be then. And this is this is a separation that people have to make. When you become perfected and you're in heaven, you are able to, for instance, some of the classic things, just like Mitch said, you know, you 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 don't. People say, "Why well, we shouldn't remember those things? Well, our family members that we know that aren't going to be there, uh, things because that's going to make us sad." And God says, "We're not going to be sad in heaven." But it's not that we'll remember it, but we'll have the capacity to be able to deal with that in the presence of God and as these new people that we're going to be, we'll, we'll have the capacity to be able to deal with those things. We can't do that now because we're in these failed human personages of who we are. So, But when we're in the presence of God, for instance, they're seeking, they know what's happening. We just read this. They know, they clearly see what's happening on the earth. So they see the sin, they see the degradation, they see everything that's happening on earth, and it doesn't corrupt them in any way. They see it, and what do they long for? Well, God's justice and retribution, and there's nothing wrong with that. They'll be able to deal with it in a capacity that we can't deal with as humans that we are now. That's a good, that's a good point. I'm glad you explained it that way, because God knew about our sin, and knows about it, and he's not corrupt because of that. So, okay, I, I got gotcha. you. Okay. It says, The martyrs in heaven pray for judgment on their persecutors who are still at work hurting others. They are acting in solidarity with, and in effect, interceding for the suffering saints on earth. This suggests that saints in heaven are both seeing and praying for saints on earth. Hmm. I praying for? Yeah, well they're they're that's what they're doing in this Sure. In this verse they're nine. Speak, possibly and, speaking to the Lord on our behalf or saying something, you know, I mean, you know, they're with him. I mean, we we pray to the, us praying to the Lord is speaking to the Lord. They're speaking to the Lord there, so in a way they're praying. They're <clears throat> yeah. Maybe that's why the Catholics think the way they do then. Well, I thought that uh, as I read this last comment here, I was I, I immediately thought of Catholicism, but it's really not the same. These are saints in heaven who are praying for us. This is not people on earth praying to saints in heaven. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, and and the other side of that is these people praying for us in heaven aren't making intercession for our sins. They're not doing that. They may be asking. They may be. Um, um, Speaking to God on our behalf to say, Lord, you know, look after, protect my loved ones. You know, watch it. They're they're coming to Him. They're they're pleading with Him on our on our behalf to maybe protect us in this life or watch us or you know help us through this life and things of that nature. In no way with are they taking away our sins or covering our sins for us. And that's what's applied in Roman Catholicism that you pray to them so that your sins will be forgiven and 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 that they'll they'll somehow intercede on your behalf for your sins and it doesn't work that way. Or they'll fight for you. You know, or they'll do something. They'll right. they'll come down. These saints will come down, or these family members will come down and help you in certain instances. And right. I don't know if that's you know. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't. I wouldn't say that's the diff The sense I would just say that they're you know they're pleading their their case for their loved ones before the Lord. Much like, for instance, uh, we read earlier that we know people are doing that. They're asking God to be avenged, and they want the things on the earth to stop. Because people are suffering, because people are dying, because the earth is getting more terrible, more terrible as the days go. So they are clearly praying and trying to intercede in that capacity in heaven. They're almost yeah. like rooting. Well, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's very good. That's a very good analogy. The analysis of that. Yeah, it's it's almost like rooting for us, or you know. Um, it's a personal relationship. They're talking just like, for instance, if I if I knew another family member what was in need. And I came to you, Luke, and said, Luke, you know, I, can you help, you know, help me help this person out? Uh, please help this person out. You know, help him get through this. Right. Um, in, in the same way, as a family, we 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 intercede on each other on each other's behalf. You know what I mean? I, that's a very good thing uh, concept. I hadn't thought about that, but uh, there's there's a couple of worldly sayings that uh, I think are interesting and can relate to heaven. Uh, you know, have uh, friends in high places, and uh, you know it helps helpful in life. Uh, uh, it, it's not what you know, but who you know. What, when it comes to salvation, it's not what you know, but who you know. It's Jesus. Right. You know, this person of Jesus Christ. I know He's my Savior, 
Uh, it's not my works or my understandings or my studies or anything else. It's this person. It's who I know. Uh, that's been true in my life. I know that I've had uh, various jobs over my lifetime, and there's several times I've gotten jobs because I knew the right person. Connections. Uh, connections. Yeah, conne connections. Connections. Uh, and then, and then, regarding the saints in heaven, now uh, if you have friends in high places, these people could be, or maybe this is the case, an example of this case where they could be interceding on, for, on our behalf. As I think someone mentioned that already, that uh, we do not pray to saints like like Roman Catholics. They have all a whole long list of saints that they pray to for whatever they want. Uh, but no, this is different. The saints in heaven are praying for us, perhaps. Yeah, my cousin Vinny's up there. I got connections. I think. Uh, Vinny? No, yeah, I my think, cousin Vinny. I think, Luke, I think your point there was great. That that was the point. In both cases, for instance, the, the saints that are in heaven are, who are they speaking to? They're speaking to God on our behalf. Um, when we pray, mm -hmm. we're speaking to God on others' behalf. We're not speaking to others. Like, I don't pray to my father-in-law to get something done for me. If I pray, I pray to God. But I have often prayed to, to God and said, Lord, you know, let Dad know that I'm thinking about him. You know, tell him I'm thinking about him. And tell him, you know, let my other loved ones know I'm thinking about him. Let them know I'm trying down here. You know, let them know if you can, you know, that uh, – he he would be so tickled at the idea if he knew I was on YouTube uh, uh, every week, you know, doing these things, putting my putting myself out there for who knows who to see, you know, out there in the world. He he'd be so tickled by that. So you know, those are things. But I pray to him to speak to them because I can't speak directly to them. He's got to be my way to my way to get through to them. So there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, yeah, it's like the operator, you know? right? Catch yeah. me in here, you know? Yeah, uh, Eric, I was so happy to hear you say that. I, I do that all the time. You know, I have loved ones in heaven, and I know I can't communicate directly to them, but I, I pray, Jesus, would you tell them? Would you tell them I'm thinking about them? I haven't forgotten them, and so on. And I, you know, I'm, you know, I hope that that's correct. That God will will do that. And I'm glad I'm not the only one that, that believes that. It says. Um, uh, those in heaven are distinct individuals. <clears throat> it says, quote, then each of them was given a white robe, verse 11. There isn't one merged identity that obliterates uniqueness, but a distinct each of them. <clears throat> yeah, so, uh, yeah, we don't become like uh, part of the collective, uh, like in uh, Star Trek, the Borg. Remember them? Yeah, I want a, I want a special cut, you know, toga. <laughs> You know, I want different, a different robe, different white robe. You know, with a different cut. You know, so, so I, I know it's always got to be the same color. I might get a coat of every color. I don't know, but, but you know, if it's got to be white, then I've got to have at least some different. You know. I don't know. No, it's, you know, you, I, you it's know. funny. It's funny, but you say that you're being facetious. But at the same time, it's like I mean, I think there will be. Uh, even though I, to some people, they would hear this conversation and go, "That's so. That's so petty." No, it's not. It's it's um it's uniqueness, and I think there will be a uniqueness in heaven to us all. I mean, there will be a uniqueness from the people. We'll know. We'll know each other. We may look different. But we'll know each other as each other. I mean, I, there's no, I have no reason to believe that when I see you guys. I mean, in fact, it'll be such a case of when I see you guys, they're all know right away it's you guys. You'll know it's me. We'll, we'll know who's who. We'll, we'll know it. Um, but there will be a, definitely be a uniqueness to everybody. Tanya mentioned earlier the crowns. We've talked about the crowns. There definitely is a uniqueness. There's a uniqueness to responsibilities, to rewards, um, and, and that's Don't we part need of a the new name too. Like we each get a new name or something. Yes. That is yeah. mentioned. Yeah, I think it also says that to only God and I and I will know my name. So I, it's private between God and me. I, I Tanya, think it does say that. Yes, I think it's. Tanya, I, 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 sorry, Tanya, I won't be able to share that with you. <laughs> Here's an interesting idea. Uh, uh, a lot of people think that, um, uh, like, for example, Thomas Jefferson. People think of him as uh, as a Christian and a, and a, a uh, not an atheist, but a theist. But he was not. He was a deist. Uh, and uh, I think people think of Buddhism as a religion that believes 
uh, in th is is not atheistic; it's theistic. But it's not. It, uh, Buddhism is uh, believes in deism rather than theism. So my question, since I made the point, is: Can someone clarify the difference between de deism and theism? Uh, theism is believing that there is one God, and deism is believing there are many gods. I think. Well, well no, polytheism no. and monotheism. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mono, monotheism is one god. Polytheism is multi, like like um like oh. Mitch was saying. Um, theism versus deism. I, I think theism is a belief. I want to say this correctly. I might not get it right, but theism is the belief that there is a a person of deity, such as God, a you know gods or God as people. Oh, yeah, that and interacts, deism, right? Yeah, deism is sort of like a force. It's sort of like a um. It's not really a person. It's not personal. It's it's like a. It's just like a an entity of its own that's sort of more like a force than a personal thing. Like Einstein kind of believed the same thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's that's a good uh, clarification of that. So um, Thomas Jefferson was a deist. He he was atheist. He was, but he believed in a uh, some kind of life force or energy or creator that's a deity, but not not that the deity was a personal god that actually interacts with us. Uh, and that is also what Buddhism is is based upon is deism. Uh, they believe there's this uh, universal life force, and and through reincarnation, doing good and growing, you eventually become become part of that one force. And that's what I'm talking about: the collective versus the uniqueness uh, that we have. Uh, we're no, we're not going to just merge into God and become part of God and part of this collective consciousness, like they like they would say. No, this this verse here tells us, and many others tells us, in eternity, we'll retain our uniqueness in our individuality. Um, it's, it says, the martyrs wearing white robes suggest the possibility of actual physical forms because disembodied spirits presumably don't wear robes. Uh, the robes may well have symbolic meaning, but it doesn't mean they couldn't also be physical. The martyrs appear to have physical forms that John could actually see. Yeah. Why does the spirit need uh, to wear a robe? Uh, why does he see them uh, um, as people with physical well, that's, forms? And that's another interesting thing. He never refers to them as spirits. He never refers to them in that way. Yes. No, he never does. Uh, yeah, he, he's we're talking about them as being uh, people uh, wearing robes, not some yeah. spirit uh, spirits of people. And and here uh, to me, this is worth bringing up again. But uh, calling on a some kind of a spirit, uh, I, I think that uh, in uh, with Saul, he didn't he used somebody to to get the spirit of of Saul, Winch, the witch of Endor. Yeah. And was that really the spirit of Saul in that case? Uh, Samuel. Uh, yes. Uh, that was Saul yeah. getting the, the getting the spirit of Samuel. Right. Now I'd have to go back and take another look, but I'm wondering if that was actually the spirit of Samuel, uh, or if it was just something that appeared as the spirit of Samuel. Which, because I believe today that there's many cases of uh, uh, demons that appear and misrepresent themselves as disembodied spirits of people. Well, this one actually prophesied, so and it was Samuel that prophesied mm -hmm. to Saul about what was going to happen. So, but in this case, if that is the case, then here's an example of a spirit, not a not a physical person, uh, coming to the earth and, and speaking to Saul. Uh, so that means to me that there um, it could be both ways, and therefore, if that was the case. Right now, they would have referred to them as spirits, just as the just as uh, Samuel's was referred to as Samuel's spirit. This doesn't say the spirits of these martyrs; it says the martyrs. Yeah, well, I don't know that uh, you don't have both, because we are both a body and a spirit. And I, I, and as far as the well, the occurrence in the Witch of Endor was calling out to the spirits, I think that this was an an intervention. I don't think that. I don't know that the Witch of Endor could always call up spirits, especially from heaven itself. 
But be that as it may, uh, for purposes of, uh, of revelation, Samuel was able to speak like a spirit to Saul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the point I'm trying to make uh, is important here is that uh, here you have an example of Samuel's spirit and then in other cases we have examples of it it doesn't refer to them as spirits, it refers to them as martyrs and, and people and so on. So um, to me that helps me uh, uh, believe that, that well they're not all spirits yeah. because if they, if they were all spirits they would refer to them again as spirit just as it did with Samuel's appearance being a, his spirit being uh, uh, mm -hmm. alright um, God is, he says God answers their questions indicating communication and process in heaven it also demonstrates that we won't know everything in heaven. If we did, we would have no questions. The martyrs knew more after God answered their question than they than before they asked it. There is learning in the present heaven. Ah, uh, good point. They wouldn't have asked when are our spirits or souls going to be avenged or whatever, or however it was worded. Mm -hmm. They would know. Yeah, good point. Yeah, they were told to wait a little longer until the number of the fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed. Yeah, so... Can you open the flu? I think it's closed. What? <laughs> what? No, he was talking to someone else. <laughs> oh, I thought he said my name. You know, you know, it's funny, um, and I wanted to say this with Mitch there, though. There is, and actually I'm, I'd be part of that as well, there is a debate back on that whole Witch of Endor thing. There's a big debate about that, actually, as far as people saying that was not actually Samuel that was speaking. So th 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 I'm not, I'd have to look into it a little bit more, but I know there's a, there's a, that's actually a big point of debate for people. There's, there's like big, uh, big conversations that go on about that, that, um, that event. So I, I, I got to look more into it. I don't know for certain myself, but I, I know I've heard that that's a, a, a very debated topic. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I don't know if... Um what it was either if it was really him or not but um, what Luke said is right and I absolutely agree with him that demons do like try to imitate um, dead people and, and I think that's oh. what the scripture meant when it said uh, that they are familiar spirits, familiar absolutely. being you know people absolutely. we're familiar with yeah. and that, that's one of the things I try and convince people when they, when they talk about this communion with the dead and talking to their loved ones, it's not their loved ones they're talking to. They're, they're, right. they're speaking to, uh, to demons who are trying to influence them. And because the demons, through enticing them to that, that always leads to more um, studies into dark things. It, it makes them delve into getting with mediums and trying to keep communing with the dead. So that's just not to get yeah. off track too far. But, and know. plays with our emotions too. Ex exactly. Works. Exactly. Because they know you. Yeah, I've, I've seen actually the video on the guy that was an ex-Satanist that, that spoke about these things. Uh, but as far as the uh, scriptures are concerned, the, the, the major thing is, is that when, when Samuel came back, he actually did prophesy. And so and it was, prophecy was from, you know, from Samuel. It wasn't from a demon. So that, that's, you know, and I have to go over the account, uh, but, but basically... Um, you know, that's the that's from what I understand. That's what the account was. Well, I hope that uh, next time you guys come back with more answers on Samuel, you both uh, uh, have like a little homework assignment. Oh, I hate homework. <laughs> <laughs> My dog ate it. <laughs> okay. Uh, his uh, Randy Alcar's next point is he says God promises to fulfill the martyrs' requests, but says they will have to wait a little longer. Those in the intermediate heaven live in anticipation of the future fulfillment of God's promises, unlike the eternal heaven, where there will be no more sin, curse, or suffering on the new earth. The present heaven coexists and watches over an earth under sin, the curse, and suffering. Uh, hmm. Yeah, it's like, uh, what do they call them? Uh, uh, the witnesses, a cloud of witnesses, maybe they're, uh, I hate to think about them being able to deserve too much, really, because I really get a guilty conscience sometimes when I know I've misbehaved. 
<laughs> I'd like to think I got some degree of privacy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, he also says there is time in the intermediate heaven. Uh, the white robed martyrs ask God a time dependent question How long, sovereign Lord, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? They are aware of times passing and are eager for the coming day of the Lord's judgment. God answers that they must wait a little longer until a certain, event, certain events transpire on earth. Waiting requires the passing of time. That's an interesting point. I mean, a lot of people think that time doesn't exist, in, in, well, in eternity at least, and, and maybe they think it doesn't exist in this intermediate heaven too. Yeah, you know, there's another interesting side to this is that there are a lot of people who would have you believe that when you desire for God's vengeance to take place, that's a wrong thing, and it's not true. It's not true at all. God never tells them that they're wrong for wanting him to avenge things. That, 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 that's God is the avenger. If anyone's going to take revenge for something, it's going to be God. He's the one who's the only one who can. We're not to take revenge. But to desire God's vengeance upon something, that's not wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. You're a very vengeful person, Eric. Well, you know, <laughs> well, I do it again. It, it's strange how, uh, what was it, uh, Cain and Abel, where, where, where uh, God had said, you know, his blood cries out, you know. Ah, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then uh, point number 20 is the people of God in heaven have a, lo a strong familial connection with those on earth who are called their, quote, fellow servants and brothers, unquote, in verse 11. We share the same Father, quote, from heaven whom every family in heaven on and on earth is named, unquote, Ephesians 3.15. There is not a wall of separation within the bride of Christ. We are one family with those who've gone to heaven ahead of us. After we go to heaven, we'll still be one family with those yet on earth. These verses demonstrate a vital connection between the events and people in heaven and the events and people on earth. I wonder oh. which of the saints would be the coolest to hang out with in heaven. Well, I've, I've often thought that my, I'm most anxious to meet uh, Paul, uh, but um, I don't know. There's just so many f amazing, amazing people throughout history in the Bible that uh, we were really fascinating to be able to spend some time with. Uh, of course, Paul will probably have a long, long list of people waiting to talk to him, so I'll have to take a number. Yeah, um, I think I'll have time. <laughs> sure, I'll bump <laughs> into him at some point. Like when people yeah, ask me, yeah. people eventually ask me, I'll get my turn. I know that eventually. <laughs> I'll have to stand in line. Now, now, uh, now serving number. <laughs> <laughs> Signing autographs. <laughs> yeah, and his uh, uh, final book. point. The final point on this, these verses is, uh, he says, on, uh, Our sovereign God knows down to the last detail all that is happening and will happen on earth, including every drop of blood shed and every bit of suffering undergone by his children. The voice of the martyrs estimates that more than 150,000 people die for Christ each year, an average of more than 400 per day. God knows the name and story of each one, he knows exactly how many martyrs there will be, and he's prepared to return and set up his kingdom when the final martyr dies. Wow. Yeah, that is interesting. When I read the verse in the beginning here, he's talking about, uh, I had to wait until, uh, uh, as they were, had been, until it had been completed, until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been, was completed. <clears throat> so, yeah, there. I guess there's, um, you know Brain Audi? Yes. She has some uh, uh, really uh, interesting ideas. Some of them are just way over my head. It's just like um, too mind-boggling to try to follow. <clears throat> but she, she believes that there's certain numbers that are preset that we have to reach. And I think this go, kind of goes along with that, that uh, there's a, uh, a certain number of martyrs that has to, that God knows that the number and that's that has to be completed, uh, and then uh, 
and then uh, the last person to get saved. And I mean, God knows the very last person to be saved, and until it's done, it not, the next step can't happen. Imagine looking down in heaven going, you know, we're waiting. Come on now. <laughs> yeah, that sounded very Jewish, the way you said that, Mitch. Yes, we're waiting. We're waiting for you. <laughs> Mitch, Mitch, you've been very influenced by the, the Jews, and I, I'm glad that you uh, didn't fall completely into Judaism with all... What are you talking about? Of course I'm Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, then he says, uh, I've made these observations on the intermediate heaven based only on three verses. Unless there is some reason to believe that the realities of this passage apply only to one group of martyrs and to no one else in heaven, and I see no such indication, then we should assume that what is true of them is also true of our loved ones already there and will be true of us when we die. Uh, so... Uh, we're going to page 68. We'll pick up there next time. I'd like to have a remaining time here just to, for us to discuss uh, what we've said so far and any final thoughts. Oh, man. Anything surprise anybody uh, in what uh, we covered today? Not so much surprise, but kind of made me excited for, for what I think it's going to be like and, and, and the whole idea that we're – I believe that we are going to experience heaven physically, and um, I think that that's a really great thing. Yeah. Yeah, I think more than surprise or anything, um, uh, it just it just uh, builds more for me on the foundation that I've already kind of established in this, and that, that I've already basically I had already accepted that this that heaven was going to be a physical thing for us to enjoy. And just on a side note too, just briefly on something we just touched on, um, this is totally off topic, but I just want to put this out there for people who may be listening. Um, we need to say a lot of prayers, especially at this time. There's a lot of things going on in the Middle East and things like that uh, in Syria. Christians are being, a lot of Christians are being killed yeah. on a daily basis. And um, just remember them in your prayers uh, because this is happening with, <laughs> nobody's really doing much to lift a finger uh, to help them or do anything about it. So just uh, keep those people in your prayers, our brothers and sisters out there who are suffering. Yeah, amen. Um, it seems like the only group in the world that is, is a fair game for persecution today are Christians. Uh, it seems like all other groups are being protected, and when, but when Christians are persecuted all over the world, uh, I mean, I could single out, uh, you know, Islam as as a main culprit, but it's not only that. Just uh, even in this country, you know, it's 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 okay to uh, uh, it's it's okay for people to mock Jesus in this country all the time and mock Christianity and and, and the Bible. But uh, yep. Yep. Uh, you don't do that. You don't do that about uh, you know other religions or other uh, uh, ethnicities or anything else. It's, so it's. Um, the persecution that, that I've endured in my life, uh, probably the worst persecution I've ever endured is just dealing with some of the people on YouTube that are, uh, you know, have come against me. And, and that's, actually, that's, that's fun to me. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's, uh, I don't really think it's fun. I'm glad you get a kick out of it, <laughs> Mitch, because uh, I, I do have feelings, and, you know, I, I don't like people to dislike me and call me names and stuff, but I'm, I'm thinking in perspective. You know, th that kind of thing, it's like that saying, sticks and stones will break my bones, but names and faces can't hurt me, you know. Look, when I think of what's happened to saints all around the world where they're being physically abused and tortured and murdered, and the fact that someone calls me a heretic or, a, or some name or something, that's, that's a tiny thing to endure. So I'm thankful that my persecution and is, is, you know, not even worth mentioning. So I think it's a very good thing for you to suggest, Eric, that we we pray for the saints around the world for who are being persecuted and martyred every day today. And it's 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 sad, but uh, uh, you know they have eternity. They have eternity of joy and bliss. So uh, you know what we endure now. Even if someone isn't suffering, even if you have a life that's just seemed to be so blessed, uh, this life 
as scripture says that life is like a vapor it appears for a short time and then disappears so even 80 years or 100 years if you live that long is just not even a drop in the in the sea of, of eternity so that's really what uh, we need to concentrate on is that will we have eternal life in the kingdom of God with Jesus and the saints or will we not have it and suffer death, the second death in the lake of fire so uh, this life is short and you need to get it right uh, let me ask uh, sister Tanya um, do you uh, do you know what is required for someone to get saved I do would you mind would you mind sharing that with anybody who may watch this video? Tell them the good news of how they can be saved? Yes, it's, it's very easy and very simple. You just have to uh, completely rely on Christ for uh, your righteousness to be forgiven for your sins. And it's, that's it. Just, just uh, believe that he did it for you and took care of it for you and just have faith in that and trust him and that it's that simple mm -hmm. he, he's the only way to the father and and it's just by believing in him mm -hmm. amen amen yeah so all, all the people who are watching uh, this video either live or in the future uh, it you know it's, it's it's a cliche they say they say Christianity is not a religion Christianity is a relationship uh, and and what we're asking you today is we're not asking you to join a religion or become a religious person or follow some set of religious rules forget that that's what all the religions ask you to do or require of you and that will get you nowhere except the lake of fire so we're asking you to do something different we're asking you to have a relationship with Jesus Christ where you're depending on him for your salvation he's the only one that can give it to you he's the only one because he's God the Jesus name literally means God saves so you need God to save you and he loves you so much that he came down from heaven and he became a man and he said the reason he came down from heaven and became a man was so he would give his life as a ransom for us so he died on the cross he paid for all of our sins so now no, there's no longer a barrier between man and God Jesus paid the sin debt so now you're free to have this relationship with Jesus but it's, it's, it's a free will decision you you get to decide do you want a relationship with Jesus as your Savior do you want to put your faith in him now some of you are saying well you already have faith well many of you have a lot of faith but sadly it's misplaced you're putting your faith in religion you're putting your faith in your personal performance reject all that we're asking you to put your faith in the Savior and there's only one his name is Jesus Christ he's God the Son of God manifest in the flesh who died for our sins and here's the here's the, the good part he's alive today he raised himself from the dead he said he would give us a sign of who he is and what he can do by raising himself from the dead he proved he is God he has the power over life and death and he's offering life everlasting to everyone who comes to him for it so no Christianity is not a religion religion leads to hell Christianity is a relationship and Jesus is reaching out if you see the icon on my channel it shows Jesus's pierced hand reaching out to you He's reaching out to you right now. He's saying, I want you to, to come to me. I'll give you eternal life. Reach out to him. Embrace him. Put your faith in him completely. Reject everything else and instead rely, depend completely on the Savior, and he'll give you eternal life. So we've got a long ways to go in this study. Oh, by the way, if anybody decides to do that now, please make a comment on the video because nothing would make us happier. And the Bible says that uh, the, uh, the angels in heaven will all rejoice every time someone else puts their faith in Jesus. And, and we'd like to celebrate if, if that's what you do. Uh, so we're just scratching the surface on heaven. Uh, this is the fourth video. Most of the series is that we've done in these hangouts, the, the, most of them last four, five, six sessions. I think this is going to be last many, many sessions because there's so much great stuff to learn about heaven so uh, 
we got a lot more to go. Uh, this next Wednesday will be Christmas, so we're going to take that day off so we can just be with our families, and we're not going to have anything on Wednesday. But next Sunday, we'll be back with the next episode. We'll pick up where we left off. So each of the saints here, uh, uh, just say your goodbyes and your final statement to, to, to anybody watching. Uh, Brother Eric? I'm just... Uh... Everything that Luke said, <laughs> um, and Tanya, uh, uh, you know, it's simple. Um, it doesn't take. Uh, people tend to think everything takes a lot of effort. Uh, it's it's got to be your work, what you've done, what you've done. But it's just so wrong to trust in what you've done because, as part of the problem, you can't be part of the solution. So uh, Jesus has to be that solution for you. So um, as Luke said, uh, especially this time of year, you know. Um, a little bit about what we talked about earlier. Uh, Christians, especially this time of year, tend to be a little bit more vehemently attacked, and it's because people, you know, the enemy knows this time of year we tend to talk a little bit more about Jesus, a little bit more freely than we normally do than the rest of the year, and uh, he really hates that. So um, you be sure when you're out there, say Merry Christmas to somebody, um, and uh, and show them the love of Christ. Uh, just holding a door or being one of those people who's, when you're out Christmas shopping or doing what you might be doing, who uh, shows a little love and patience and kindness instead of uh, a lot of the opposite that's going on right now. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Brother Eric. I appreciate you being here with me. No problem. And uh, Brother Mitch? Yes, I, I wanted to talk about uh, Christ. You know, you once you come to Christ and you have salvation, okay, what you need to do is you need to get some box tops. And we need to send them to my address, okay, along with some Bazooka Joe, um, uh, those little, if you know what Bazooka Joes are, send them to me along with your 1995. And I will make sure to put a people, that's my whole point. When it talks about not adding anything to your faith, it means nothing. There's no box stops you have to save. There's no money you have to send in. There's no extra works you have to do, although when your heart is filled with the love of Christ, you will do good things. But first and foremost, salvation is a free gift that's given to you. And if anybody else tells you that now that you're saved, you need to now try to save yourself again because your salvation didn't take unless you do good works, don't listen to them. Understand that God's love for you is not something you have to pay for. The rest of the world and everybody thinks that now that God has done this wonderful thing on me, for me on the cross, yeah. now some, somehow or another, what should I do? It's not about what you do. It's about what Christ did for you. Rest in it. And believe me, you'll do wonderful works for Christ. But you don't need to pay him back. It's almost like if somebody gives you something, you feel like you have to go tit for tat and buy, it, buy them something back. That's not the way salvation works. That's an insult to God. But the, the gift of God is something that's given to you to enjoy. So when you come to Christ, enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Enjoy it. Thank you, brother. And uh, Sister Tanya. And I'm just going to add a little bit to that and um, just say that the Bible has two parts. It's the Old Testament and the New Testament. And that word testament means covenant. And covenant means um, an agreement, uh, a deed, a legal contract. And the great thing about the new covenant, the new contract, this new deed, is that God made it with himself, with Jesus, not with us. So we really don't have to worry about failing him because he didn't make that agreement with us. He made it with himself because we would just – we would – fail. <laughs> and also I just wanted to say this one saying that I love. It's religion says do, Jesus says done. And that's really that's really how it is. And and once you can grasp that and sometimes it takes a while cuz it's hard for us to just accept grace, you know, cuz we always we're, we're just brought up thinking we have to do something to get something. That's just the way we're raised. Once you can get past that and realize it's not about you or anything you've done, then you'll know what peace feels like, and it's wonderful. And I just 
pray everybody gets that because it's such a great feeling. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I've enjoyed being here, and I can't wait till the next one. This is such a good topic. I'm really enjoying talking about this. Okay. Oh, and one more thing. Um, we were talking about people um, being, you know, tortured and martyred for Christ right now, especially in Syria. There's a book that's called Tortured for Christ, and I think it's just a must-read for any Christian or non-Christian. It's just such a good book, and it's actually available for free. Anybody can get a copy of it, and I'm going to put the link to it um, in the comment section of the, the YouTube feed so that um, if anybody's interested, all you got to do is fill out your address, and they ship it to you for free. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, thank you, sister. Uh, I want to thank all the panelists, and I uh, hope you join us uh, next Sunday. Normally, these hangouts, uh, the show is um, live every Wednesday and Sunday, 5 p.m. Pacific time. We try to make it about two hours long, and uh, and then we probably talk another two hours after the show. <laughs> privately because it's so much fun talking about Jesus. Okay. Uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.